Welcome everyone and welcome to Textiles and Tea with the Hand Weavers Guild of America. I'm Kathy Group. I'm the Advertising and Marketing Manager and I'm your host today. Today's episode of Textiles and Tea is sponsored by the Weavers Guild of St. Louis in memory of one of their own guild members. And I think it's so wonderful that they do this for Laura Blumenfeld. Thank you, Guild. That's a great idea. We will take questions today as always. The last 15 minutes will be for our questions. If you would please put them in the Q&A and not in the chat. I just don't see them when they're in the chat. We love your comments though, keep those coming. Today we have Laura Strand. Now Laura is the professor of textile, the head of textiles at Southern Illinois University in Edwardsville, Illinois. She has a comprehensive background in formal training in weaving, surface design, paper making, book binding, and tabasketry through a BFA from the Georgia State University. She also has an MFA from the University of Kansas in Lawrence. She's exhibited widely, she's lectured throughout the United States, and as a working artist, her interests include the interface between feminism and visual culture, exploring the connection between the textile field and our Western culture, understanding of women's work. As an artist and as a person, she engages in an effort to link the rich heritage of the textile arts with the contemporary theoretical discourse. Thank you so much for being here today, Laura. It's wonderful to have you. It's wonderful to be here. So we're gonna start off with the most important question. What is your favorite tea? Oh, oh, right this minute, I'm addicted to stash raspberry hibiscus. Oh, that's good. <laughs> good taste. <laughs> so how did you get started in fibers? I, you know, really I started as a child. My mother did always a lot of textiles. She made a lot of our clothes. She made um, she, she made objects. We we braided a rug. We she made curtains. She did a, a lot of wonderful things. She was also she worked full time as an X ray technician. She was like doing everything. I I understood that I loved textiles so deeply because I learned as an apprentice. And I'm still focused on this idea of people learning at the hand of another person, not learning in a lecture situation, seeing it from a distance, but having someone sit next to you and work with you directly and have a conversation that links the ideas that you're working with to all, all of the ideas that you're learning. Um, that one-on-one -on -one learning still remains really important for me. Well, speaking of one-on-one -on -one learning, did you always know that you wanted to teach? And then when did you realize you wanted to do it at a collegiate level? I, as an undergraduate, I understood that I wanted to teach. I had hoped that I could go to graduate school right away. I really knew that that was going to be difficult economically. I went to Georgia State downtown and and. Uh oh, got a little hiccup. I think she'll be back as we wait. Um, for those of you who don't know, we're HGA is based out of Atlanta, so Georgia State's right downtown. So when she was talking about the program, it's a program they're quite aware of. Um, as we're waiting for Laura to come back, um, just a reminder some things that are coming up uh, down the road for HGA. We have our Guild Development Retreat later on. There she is. Hi, Laura. <laughs> I think you're on mute. Hit your mute button. I've been on Zoom all day. I've taught two, I've taught six hours on Zoom. <laughs> I don't know why it comes out on me. It's and tired. <laughs> it's tired. Anyway, I learned to teach at Calumwald, and I really knew I wanted to go back to graduate school. So I, at, um, I guess I was 33 when I went back to graduate school at University of Kansas. And I think it was hard to find jobs then. And I did a research project as a, you know, in, as I neared the end, looking for how many positions there were in the country. They're really are not very many, they're fewer now. Colleges are letting go of their textile programs as mm. they diminish in size. And colleges are all gonna be diminishing in size because there are fewer 
fewer people now. There are fewer, fewer new incoming students. And so it's, it's getting to be even a harder and harder position to take. And yet, despite the fact that universities want more and more from professors, and it can be an overwhelming engagement, there's still like there's a miracle of a classroom full of students, young people, actually older people too, people who come wanting to understand something about the nature of textiles, the nature of this idea that I'm putting forward, even students who are engaged in some other media and have to take a broader media and come take it with me. I think um, it's so common for me to have seniors at the end of their classes finally taking a class that they need to finish saying, why didn't I know about this all along? I'm really interested in this. I, it's um, it's, an, it's a, just a, a rapturous engagement to be in. It's so broad. There are so many different areas to study. I, um, I, you know, I, I'm in love with it and I'm in love with teaching. I can tell just as you talk, your, your passion really shows through. Let's, let's look at some of your work. This, um, these next images are Dreams of the Mississippi and Mississippi, now is it 23-40 or 2,340? 2, 2,340 miles. That's how oh, okay. Mississippi is. Okay, 234, 340 miles. Yeah. Um, so these are your two images. Now, these are aerial views of the Mississippi Valley. What drew you to this subject matter? I, you know, as a kid, one of the towns we lived in when I was a kid was Winona, Minnesota, which is a sandbar in the Mississippi. Uh -huh. and then when I took this job at University of um, Southern Illinois, Edwardsville, Edwardsville is 30 minutes from St. Louis City. So I my mean, husband works on the other side of the river. I drive back and forth. I see the arch all the time. And the, the, the river, and here we are in St. Louis, the confluence of the Missouri and the Mississippi. It's a rich, it, the, the land is rich from years and years of, of flooding. And, and it's a rich, wet place in the world. And as I traveled around, I've been able to do, I'm like a textile nerd. I travel and get to see people working in other places, which I love. And I was so strikingly aware of places in which it is so dry that they that there, it's difficult to grow things. And so that was a, a focus, wet, dry. Those were things I was working on in my work before I came across this. But when I flew over the country to you know, go to conferences in California, there, there they were on the ground, these big, beautiful circles, this incredible formal composition. I just took photographs and took photos. They have all these terrible gray photographs that I took from the plane. But I, you know, I figured out how to make them into dense images. And then these are both jacquard pieces that were woven um, with Beth Ann Knudsen and the Jacquard um, Weaving Center in Hendersonville, North Carolina. And, Beth Ann learned to do a, a program that she taught worldwide and eventually made a, uh, she bought a, a building that became, I mean, a wonderful house that became the Jackard Center. And a number of us, uh, she was a graduate student just ahead of me. And so a number of us were able to go there and learn to use this program. And we were able to go and weave at big industry looms. I mean, big industry looms, two story tall looms. So I, I figured out how to make this happen. It wasn't until I had started to do this work that I asked and asked and tried to figure out what those circles were that I came to understand that that Western part of the Great Plains is very dry. And the only water, the water that feeds like 80% of the population is from the Ogallala Aquifer, which was laid down in glacial times and which um, they've been accessing for years, but post-World War II, there was, they figured out how that they could do a round system, right? So they're long, long arms of irrigators. And in the center, they drill down into the aquifer and water pump it up, right? They, they pump out hundreds of thousands of gallons as this slow arm reels around the field that's being watered. And they pump out hundreds of thousands of gallons. It's gone down about 8% since the, um, since, since it was first beginning post-World War II. And it's, it's a dry, it's a very, it's getting dry. And there are more and more areas at the outside edges of it in which people who have invested in those big, incredible watering systems and pumps are too dry, too dry to water. And I, you know, I, I just, I'm sad about it. Here I live 
at this confluence, this great wet place. And what we're building all the time are these big, huge warehouses so that trains come in and bring commodities. And right? so they're, they're, they're things that were wonderful fields and rich, rich, some of the richest land in the country. And yet our economic power is put into making commodity focuses for it. So I, I started to do things where I, for instance, that dry landscape, and I put a little piece of the Mississippi on top of it. And, and on the right, I, uh, my, my uncle fly, um, flew, he's retired now, flew for Continental, and he sent me airline maps. So I was able to suss out the Mississippi from it and make it on screens and print it and then gold leaf it. So, you know, just, you know, learning, learning other things to do, but I'm really, I'm devoted to the notion of protecting wetlands, pr protecting water. And, um, and then I, then I moved to a place uh, it's 14 years ago now that we have a little lake, but we, we bought a house that had a building in the back and I'm, I'm out in, in the building in this great, great studio space. And I, I have some, some pieces that I put on the wall behind me because I don't keep my website up very well. I don't <laughs> get up well at all. And, and so these are, these are pieces that I've woven based, based on that. Well, some of your work you can see on Spoonflower, right? Yeah. So would you talk a little bit about Spoonflower and the relationship between you, Spoonflower, and your students and why you got involved with Spoonflower? Um, a lot of people may not know what Spoonflower is. Oh, well, Spoonflower, I discovered it only about three or four years ago. It's an online site where you can have fabric printed. And there are tons and tons of designers and you can have anybody's fabric printed. And it, it's, you know, to buy individual fabric that you want, that's yours, that you make just for you, if you want your colors, you want your engagement, you can pay, you know, $85, $100 a yard for fabric like that. But on Spoonflower, you can look at all the, they have a million different categories. You can look for one of somebody else's that you can buy, or you can design your own. So I learned to design repeat patterns and print them when I was an undergraduate in the 70s. And I've been teaching it now since the 90s, teaching it in university programs. But then there it was. It was a place that could print and, and print lots of colors, print lots of detail, print with a lot of perfection. So I did a couple designs, printed it, and then made it as a, an assignment for one class. Just the very end, we did one. It was great. It worked well. I was able the next summer to teach in Chennai, India at Stella Morris College. I have a colleague who went to college there. We went and we wrote a grant, did workshops there. It was great, it was wonderful. Um, but I printed there and then we we printed it at uh, in Berlin. They have a spoon flower in Berlin and there's oh. one in this country. So then in spring of 2020, we weren't totally online and my class couldn't print. So I turned all the course fees into printing at Spoonflower. And it was it was amazing. Students who were not crazy about making a big mess at a table just fell in love with this process. And so some people are really designing and selling selling on Spoonflower. But that one is like, I, I don't know, I bought at, at a yard sale, I bought a, a little package of old paint by number kits, right? <laughs> and I scanned them. And, um, and then went in and moved it apart. So the, the part that is her nose was a tree and there's the little, you know, like, anyway, so it's mother nature, angry mother nature looking up out of the rushes in the water. Oh, that's great. That's a wonderful thing to get your students to do. I would love to have done that. So you, you I work. That. It's really, I know, I need to get go check it out. Um, <laughs> you also work in collaboration between some other artists. You, Pat Vivad. Kat Vivad, yeah. Vivad. Uh, Aaron Cook and you, you did a piece that we're going to show here that um, y'all work together. Now you did the jacquard weaving part of this. So what's the attraction for doing this kind of a collaboration? Uh, a collaboration is a miraculous process <laughs> because working with other people, working in another companion space, like opens up doors in your own thought process, things that you wouldn't let yourself do. Suddenly, you have to reach for something else to do. This, this was the most interesting project. It, it, Kat Vivad was a student of mine and she was a student, um, she was a graduate student in printmaking and she took a class. Actually, she took a class when Luann Reimel was teaching for me and Luann taught her how to rust dye, right? And this is how we teach it. It's like, here's an object, it's iron. 
soak your fabric in, in vinegar, wrap it around, wrap it in plastic, leave it for, you know, 8, 12, 16 hours, and then rust, rust, you get rust in your fabric. Actually, I have a piece way over here in the corner, if you can see that piece, it's a, it's a piece of rust, right? You just put rust on it. And so she worked, she worked for some years, I'd always talked about collaboration. She came to me one day and said, you know, I'm planning a project. We're going to do it at a local art center, and it's going to be a collaboration. Will you come and collaborate with me? And I, my initial thought was, oh, no, I have to do this, right? I told her it was a good idea, and I'm going to have to do it. But it was so great. So this was a whole collaborative project that Pat set up. And um, we it was six of us. Uh, Nina Gancy was one of the, the members. And Nina was a student of Pat's when she was teaching in the high school. And, and uh, Nina Gancy is a wonderful, wonderful knit designer, uh, has a great background and has, has represented in like 300 sites in the US and several, four countries. And so she has a big space that she uses. And so we met once a month, the six of us um, at Nina's um, business. And like the first thing we did was we all brought something that was dead in our box, right? You have a dead box of things that never worked, that you couldn't quite get rid of. So we brought our dead boxes and we laid them out and we went around and we chose one thing at a time. And we, we chose those things and then we were obligated to make an object with it. Like we had to use it. And it was colleagues, it was friends, it was people who had been teachers and students. And so you had to be motivated to be engaged in this process. And, and you wanted to do something that paid homage to what they had done. And so this was a piece that has Pat's um, folded, dyed, walnut, rust, her amazing fabrics on the outside. And this is the back space of a piece of Jacquard. So it, it looks different on the other side, right? Because you put all the bad colors, all the ones you're not using to the back. So she took that piece of fabric, turned it over, um, stitched around it, made it have a depth of field by quilting it and put it in combination with this. But it's a wonderful exhibition that we did. And um, there are a lot of pieces that are involved in it. What a great idea for a guild to do. Oh. Oh, it's, it's Wasn't it? fabulous. Oh, good processes in that. Like I took one of Pat's fabrics and I tore it into tiny little bits and I wove it into part of a weaving that I made that was, was part of it. I just, it made me rethink and go back and do things that I, that I hadn't thought I could do because I had to find something to do with this object. So it just opened ways of thinking that I hadn't done for myself. It was really, it turned out to be very great for all of us. I may have to approach my guild about doing something like that. That sounds like fun. Yeah, it was. Um, we, I, I read on your website, um, I continue to look for a feminine voice in art making and find it most often through the language of textiles. I love that. That's one of those things I want to put on a plaque. Would you expand on that statement and talk a little bit more about that? Yes, yes. I, I think of as a feminist i think of the feminine principle as one of caretaking of uh, creating protecting um, organizing making things so that they are um, good and productive right so like um, gardening um, peace in the world caretaking of the universe making of objects i just i think of all of those things as coming under this notion of caretaking for things in the world and caretaking for the world itself. And I find that a productive way of thinking about making art so that you're putting out work that would help people to feel the, the best of their internal lives. Think about the world as having an incredible beauty. Think about the things, I mean, I'm talking about impoverished landscapes that are dry and, and taking water from the wet. Like I'm talking about things that are not great, but I'm wishing for caretaking. I'm wishing to improve them. And rather than put them forth with an anger or a roughness or a, um, a, a disregard for craftsmanship, a, um, you know, rather than putting it forward with all the harsh language that we can think of that is about a conquering and a pushing and a, a directed nature, I think that when I put out something that has beauty, that makes people ask questions, that let me give answers, then it's a way I can confront a problem with a caretaking notion of bringing people into the fold and asking us 
to be more cautious, be more caring, be more careful. And I just think that in, in the world of the art landscape, so often artwork is focused on, on an angry dialogue and they want to be harsh and rude and cruel and harassful. And I, I just am not as interested in that work. And I find that the textile arts, people involved in the textile arts are really part of that big network of caretaking, right? Making clothes, wrap, making blankets, wrapping people. I, I taught a, a course as an interdisciplinary course for a while called um, Women's Social History Through Quilts. And one of the things that I found so interesting about that was that um, when um, Susan B. Anthony was looking to expand the notion of, of suffrage and talk to people, like the only real way of talking to people in the country was to go to the weavers, the quilting guilds. Quilting guilds were formed, you know, to help women, to improve that, to make a communication, but quilting guilds always gave and still do give to, um, to charities, to people who are retiring, like, a, you know, gave it to a minister or gave it to people who came back from missionary service or gave it to someone who had a new baby or a house that had burned down, right? It was all about this notion of being, um, generous, using your skills to help and to um, warm and protect others. But Anthony's big audience in that period of time was the quilt guilds that are organized around the country. So I think that women found their way to vote through those people who were guiders like Anthony, but through the generosity of making, not through the, you know, warrior class of going out to win the war, but through, you know, through the generosity of, of textiles. That's amazing. I've never heard that before. That's amazing. You're a wealth of knowledge, Laura. You know, I, this is like the, like the gift of teaching. It's such a gift to be in a university, a life in a university. I'm just, I'm so grateful for it because everything I hear, everything I read, I think, oh, I'm going to bring that to my students and I need to know more. So it's just this perpetual desire and, you know, and reward for going out and learning all these things. Cause then I have, I have a, a captive group of students to tell these things to. It's, it's really, it's probably usury in some ways. I, I find something that I really want to read and I think I'll use that as an assignment. <laughs> and then we all read it. And then there we you go. go. Yeah. There you go. Um, or, you know, learning something new. I really, I find that it has been incredibly beneficial to teach. Well, your approach is that there is a relationship between the fiber artwork and feminism and that textiles are part of the human language. Now, if I can throw my own two cents worth in here, when I went to art school, I came from the cornfields of Southern Indiana. I knew nothing about anything. And I remember my first art class was, I mean, I heard and heard things I'd never imagined before. So I wonder what are your students' reactions when you start, and I'm sure they're much more savvy than I, I was one at that time, but what is the reaction to some of your students when you, you put forth these ideas about these relationships between art and other things? I, I, I mean, I'm also teaching students who live in this region Right, and yeah. many of them are from rural areas. We do have more and more an influx of, of students from St. Louis, but uh, we're Midwesterners. And I think Midwesterners feel that they're on the outside edge of, of American culture because the big cultural areas of New York and California take, take sway over that. And I, my experience is that they find it interesting. They ask questions. And they all have to do research projects. And if they choose this as an area to research, or I mean, they all must find an artist to be thinking about and to do some work with, right? To think about writing about them, finding information about them, and take some of those ideas to input in some of the work they do that semester. So I think that it sets them on, if, if it makes them angry, it sends them on a, a route of searching. If it makes them happy, it sends them on a route, a route of searching. And every time I say this to a class, every time a, a group of students talks to me about it, I think it extends our, our idea about how we can move ourselves forward as individuals in the art world. It's good, it's really good. 
And it is a language. Textiles are a language. And, you know, um, the word textiles and text both come to us from uh, the, I mean, it's a Greek, it's a, it's a, the Greek word texto, um, which is where we get the word textile and where we get the word text. And there's that linkage between them hmm. that, that you're, you're putting things together line by line. And, and one of the things that I'm thinking is um, the trichies. I was able to work with the, uh, the Paul Drasang teaches taught ceramics here for years. And he, as an under, as a graduate student, went to a little town called Clahiaco in Mexico and, um, and studied some with mixed tech potters. And so we went like it was a, there was a great price out of flight. I'd only been here for like three months. And he said, let's go, right? And so we walked around the building one night and we asked students if they would go, it was a great flight. And just 10 of us went down and, um, and the, a woman that he had worked with for a long time, uh, Anita Downs, uh, you know, said, well, you know, you could come back, we could do this. And so we went out and met Treaky Weavers and Mixtec Potters. And then the next year we did a class, we did a class. We did six of them over 12 years. And so being there and working with these women for whom weaving is a, key component part of their life and that they make these big red wheat eels and they are like it's a placard they walk through town everybody knows who they are and heartbreakingly they are not thought of well right they're an indigenous society and not unlike people responded to native americans they they don't respond to them well they would say to me why do you work with them they they don't speak spanish they're dirty Right, which was craziness. Oh, the craziness. They were incredible, wonderful people. And, and it was, you know, we were able to take students down actually the whole first week. Everybody was tearful because it's like it's like it's not much hot water. And like, right? I mean, they didn't have the creature comforts that they think of as, as being Americans. But by the final week, everybody was tearful because they saw deeply into a group of people who were incredibly giving thoughtful, careful, whose lives were organized around a process that they believed in. And um, it, it's a wonderful experience, but those are all line quality um, weavings, little tiny, wonderful inlay weavings that all have a, a story that it tells about who mm. they are. And you can really, I mean, over time, if you're there, <laughs> you can get to know who wove what, what things because they, tend to choose a subject matter and a line that they, they make um, objects with that makes sense, makes sense to them and have, have an individual component space that is their, their voice in this, in this textile media. Well, we, we have some images, Whitney, if we can pull those up. Thanks, I did send some. Um, thank you, Whitney. Yes. So there's those, the, the red that you're talking about in the lines. So in those lines are stories. Yes. I don't know if you can, like, you can't really see my cursor, can you? Um, but if you can see at the bottom of, of Lucia's mother's we feel there's a, a set of intertwined lines. That's, the, that's called cambio change. And it was first developed, I mean, the, the, Lucia, well, both of these, she, the, the younger woman and the black hair and then the, the gray haired woman is her mother. She wove both of those weed pills and um, she uses change a lot because that's when the road came to Chikawasla where they live higher on the mountain. And so, and she uses brighter colors. She uses more of the little basketry motif. She likes uh, a little uh, engagement of women that are, aren't linked there, have lim women with linked arms. Um, Oh, I, I can't remember what I, I'm all thinking about, Lucia. <laughs> I can't think of what I was going to say. I'm just asking about what they were wearing. Now, on the, the right is a loom. Is it like a rigid heddle kind of loom? Is, is that, that what they used? Heddle. Yeah, it's a rigid heddle okay. loom. And that's, that's Rocio weaving on it. And Rocio is so great because she's a very young woman. She's wearing her wheat bill, but underneath it, she's wearing a t-shirt and jeans. Right, ah. she is wearing a hand-woven skirt and a, a more modest blouse, but they, um, you know, the young women are are following in that region. Although it is that, like Lucia has several younger children, and she doesn't want them to stay in in Clahiaco. She wants them 
to go out in the world to make a living in some other way. She doesn't want them to be impoverished. And this is one of the things that's sad about looking at the art world and to looking in these traditional craft relationships because people who are deeply invested in it, they know that it's a hard living mm -hmm. and they really want their children to go on to a better living. And so they should. And, and it's, it's hard for me to say, no, no, I want them to stay. I want this to continue. I don't want to lose it. But we're really looking at the end of a lot of big craft traditions in the world, because as our world progresses forward and more people make more money, there's every reason in the world why, why people who have been impoverished should move forward and make more money. And that really means that the old, um, the, the very beautifully developed technological engagements in weaving are just, we're, we're watching them, we're watching them pass by. So it, it's mm -hmm. been incredibly important to me to learn to weave from them. And, and, and you can see that um, there Erin is in that, that image and she, you know, they don't, they don't, she doesn't speak Spanish, right? I mean, <laughs> wanna just speak good Spanish, but there's something that can be said about the, the voices that moves between people that's really great. Actually, I learned a lot about teaching from them because I would walk around and just be full of language, telling people all kinds of stuff that went on and what it needed to be. And whereas when Le Lucia would show it to them, and they do it and she'd say, no. <laughs> and then she'd pull it out and she'd show it again and they'd do it, no. And <laughs> she'd pull it out again, right? And put it back in. And they learned more from 15 minutes of that back and forth with her than they learned from 10 hours of me jabbing, right? So I, I, I learned a lot about the power of, again, as I say, the, the apprenticeship to watch someone make something and copy it watch them make copy, watch them make copy and educate your hands and then your head in that range. And then you have the freedom to move forward. Well, one of the things that you, you've also done that I'm wondering if it has impacted on your artwork is that you've been the curator of fiber exhibits. So how do you think going through that process has impacted you as an artist? Um, well, exhibitions are, are always important. I, yeah, I was an artist in Atlanta for 10 years, and one of the big projects that, that a group of people that I graduated with started, and we did like as a club, right? It was a mattress factory club. There was a, a old mattress factory that was dead then, and that um, one of our members had a garage at, and so he asked if we could use that space and the sculptors made a door. That was the deal is that we could have it if we, so they you know, went through cinder block and put in a door and we had a big show and we had a lot of big shows and we would just put out an open call. They weren't juried at all. It was like, come on, come all, show your work. And it was, it was a great art education for me to see what people made. And we would like, on, by the time it opened, we would say, we're so exhausted, we're not gonna do this anymore. Um, but then we would all be there every Saturday. We would go around and talk to everybody about what they'd made. And I just learned so much about how people's ideas, their heart, their processes turn into artwork and how that communication comes across. So I've always been interested in and engaged in that. And for many years, well, actually all the years I've been at SIU, I've served on the gallery committee. And for about 10 of those years, I was the gallery director as part of, part of my um, department service. So I've, I've done, I did a lot of shows and like I know textile artists, I'm visiting, having textile artists come in as visiting um, artists. And so I just started to do exhibitions of those things. And, uh, you know, the, the article that I wrote, I had made an exhibition and I sent it, you know, to Fiber Arts and they asked me if I would write an article. It was really a wonderful, wonderful experience to, um, to get to, you know, make a language that people would see the exhibition and understand how I'd brought it together. I, th I think exhibiting gives you a chance to see and talk to people about artwork. And what I learned at the Mattress Factory was that if people can talk to you about your work, if you can bridge the gap between seeing things, so often in our world, we are so um, distanced from art making that when you see an artwork, people say, oh, I'm, I don't know anything about art. I don't know, anything. right? And they're defensive. They're, they're worried that they're, they're, they're being made to feel stupid by an object that might be so intellectually impressive that they don't really grasp onto it. But genuinely, 
if you simply get to talk to the artist about what they've made, it's, it's an experience that brings you right into their world. And you, you can feel the relationship of the visual and the, and the personal. And I think that that's a way of, of contacting the world at large. And if we would simply be more open about our work, exhibit, go to the exhibit, talk to people about your work, um, you, you would find a, a very wonderful audience, always interested. Oh, I bet, I bet. Well, one of the series of the works that you did, it's, and I'm probably pronouncing this wrong, El Tahin? El Tahin, yeah. Tahin, um, Code of Secrets. I, I was really struck by this because it's a wonderful combination of opposites. You've got, you're representing the hard stone through a very soft medium. Um, so would you talk some more about these images and your choices? Um, this was, I, I was able to go to Guatemala with a group of, with another group of people, Joe Steely, who taught at um, uh, University of Missouri, Columbia, um, Jane Landers, uh, who was a local a St. Louis artist, Jane Sauer, who ran a gallery in um, Santa Fe for many years and is an incredible artist herself. Um, we were able to, to go to Guatemala and study with, oh, now, I, Debbie Redding. Um, that's not the name she uses right now, but she um, wrote the book, How to Learn How to Weave with Debbie Redding. She lives in Guatemala. And she's part of a group of people who are Mayan hands, right? It's a, it's a group that helps indigenous people to have access to yarn that they don't have to, it, it's a fair trade organization that helps people to actually make money with the weaving they do. And so it's, it was really just three employees. Um, one who was a social worker who went out to work with people in the field, one who um, ran a, uh, an organization called Upavim that was where people sewed together and really an engaging thing. So Upavim was all women employees who sewed and got things ready to go um, out to, the, uh, to be marketed in the United States or around the world. Um, but they decided to put a certain percentage of the money that they got into a healthcare center, into daycare for ch children, um, they did tooth care and foot care. They made their business and they fed, they fed them breakfast and lunch. So they made their business be something that really supported them as individuals. As we were talking about caretaking, it's really, it's really impressive. So we were able to go and re able to go out into the world and see a lot of these wonderful things um, and, and to meet with weavers as well. It was great. But I love these images and I love the notion of turning um, all of these monumental rock pieces. I did a lot of, of this in my work for quite a while. Um, but then I, I teach paper and book arts. And so Deborah Candler, that's it. I just saw it on the chat. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hate that. I didn't think of it. Um, uh, I, I teach paper and book arts. It's not taught here in other ways. And so I teach book arts. And so I just started to make little, little books that I made into this. So the ones on the left are Organza. The picture's terrible. You really can't see the discharge of the images in them. The one on the right, you can see a little better. It's, it's printed on um, what you, Tarleton, what you use to make an etching. Right, it's sold in the cage where we are, it's sold in our store. And so I just bought that and, and printed images on it so that you can stand and look through them. It just, it, and um, Tarleton has a, a, you can like crunch it and, and make it stand up. I, I think that those little bins in those spaces at El Tahin, nobody knows what they were for. Maybe they may have been offerings or like candles, I don't know. But there's, it's a, it's a huge multi-story, engagement that has one little bin after another. And so I was just hypothesizing about what belonged in there. And I put down a bunch of information that I was thinking about and had as images and um, made little books as though they might be stories that told what the history of those empty spaces is. That's amazing. I love that idea. So when you design, how do you start? Do you draw it out by hand? Do you use a computer to try, do your design first? How do, how do you do that? Everybody's always curious how people start their design work. You know, it's so, it's so multi-part because I've, 
like perhaps bad for my career, perhaps good for my, but because I'm teaching things, I think, okay, well, if I'm going to teach that, I need to make some, right? I need to try. I need to see how that goes. I need to have things to example. And so some things I start, and really always my favorite way of starting is just to start, just to muck about with materials. I love materials. I love making processes. And so I just gather stuff together and um, and, and muck about and see what happens. And when something exciting happens, then I capitalize on that. And when I'm working through that, the idea comes up and gets stronger and stronger. Then the next pieces that get made are made with that as the core and the idea developed and researched and more idea coming forward. So it starts with kind of a raw, making it up in my hands and then gathering momentum based on ideas. And of course, the ideas come from things I'm already thinking about, things I've been reading, things I'm looking at. Um, so it's, it's, it's like a multi-part. It, it comes around and has a lot of different parts that are going on in it. But again, being involved in an art community, having people to talk to, um, and being involved with students. Students are such interesting people. They're interested and interesting. And they come at what I say with another point of view that I'm not expecting. I learn new things every day. It's, you know, I, I anyway, so I come at it from a lot of different standpoints. So what's next for you? No, no. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, I wove the Jackard readings for, I guess that started in 2002, I started that. And I did a lot of Jackard work at industry sites for a long time. And now I hear a lot about how, how heartbreaking it is for the coal industry that's going down. Nobody ever talks about the textile industry and the textile industry in the Appalachia areas through North Carolina, which is where we were weaving, is devastating. Those businesses are taking apart their um, taking apart their blooms, shipping them to Asia, all the workers, really impressively skilled people are, are, out, are out of work. And so there are fewer and fewer places to weave. And, and, and it's heartbreaking. So for many years, I have not been able to weave on a Jacquard loom. And so I was interested in hand jacquards, and I did a sabbatical in 2015 with, um, I went, to, uh, Janice Lesman Moss is not only the most amazing artist, very, very focused working artist, but also just an incredibly generous human being. And she allowed me to come and weave on um, a couple of the jacquard looms that they have at Kent State University. And, um, and so I, I First semester I wove and worked at home. And I was really so interested in that process. Less things, things are not available there that are available in industry, but also the thing that is available is that I I could, I could, I, I wasn't, I didn't have the time to do it there, but I could add a lot of different things in that I already do on my hand looms now. Mm -hmm. And so I started looking, I started really looking for a, a jacquard loom. And and I found one, Pauline Verbeek Coward, who teaches the program at, and is the head of the program at Kansas City Art Institute, was a graduate student with me at, at KU. And they are having to condense their spaces some. And so a huge um, Norwegian um, TC2 that they have um, needs to come into their own, to, into the general textile space. And so they had to get rid of some looms and she put out an announcement. And among those was a jacquard loom that they'd had for 10 years. And so there it was. It was a used loom, a used jacquard loom. And so the week before Christmas, my husband and I went and we picked it up. And actually, here I could show you. And here it is. It's in my, it's in my studio. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah, there. Oh, my God. Good for you. I have a jacquard loom. <laughs> But I can't believe it. I mean, what's on it right now is just the first, the first test. You know, just putting a warp on and just getting um, interested in weaving it. But I'm, it's here so that I can pull out. I mean, all all of these pieces are warp painted, right? I I weave, I pull it out, I paint it, wash it, rinse it, roll it back on, and then paint the weft and and weave that in. So I'm my my thought is to engage that engage the computer work that I'd always done to make those jacquard pieces. And, um, and I think I guess it's like a whole new opening for me. It's like a new, 
I, I can't tell you how excited I am. I'm, I, I get to start again with new, new, it's just great. I'm, I'm really very excited. Well, we are eagerly waiting to hear about your new show. When you get all this stuff, <laughs> like, give me one woman me. show. <laughs> Let me have, I, I'll, I went, I'm going to do that. But I really, right now, I'm just, you know, as I say, I'm going to muck about. I, as I, I put just on a warp, I'm putting a lot of basic things just into plain satins and just seeing how those structures can work, how I can change the density, you know, light and dark and light, I mean, light and dark in color, light and dark in weight, um, different materials that could um, change when they came off the loom. And just, it's, it's a totally wide open field and I'm really excited to get my fingers in there. Well, that's exciting. It's good to see that the loom's got a good home. I'm, yeah. <laughs> Yes, it's a good home. It's yes, a very good home. You know, who, who wants to leave the process? Who wants to leave? I'm uh, just, it, it's always a new beginning. And I'm, I have visions of, of little weavers standing outside your door going, can I, can I try? <laughs> that might, I try that, too. Might be <laughs> that, might, that might happen again, eventually. But right this minute, I, 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 I moved even east from Edwardsville, we were looking for a place where we could have studios. My husband's a potter and a blacksmith, and um, we wanted studio space. He had a studio in downtown St. Louis, and it was oh, wow. to work at night, right? Because the power hammer is a really loud thing. So we we managed to piece, find a piece of property. It's pretty wonderful. It has a little lake. It had a big building. Dan's built another big building. Yay! And, um, we have so we have we have studio space, and but we're really an hour now from St. Louis. Um, so I live pretty far away. I don't know that many people want to come out and, and visit me, but um, sure, eventually students will come out. Well, let's check with some questions because there's a bunch. Let's All see right. what people are asking. Um, this is Jillian Bine, I believe that's how you pronounce her name. What is your suggestion on finding mentors in weaving? She says she's been weaving for five years. She's self-taught, but she would love to study under someone who spent years learning the craft, but I've never been able to find someone. Is there resources on how to find fellow weavers? Well, first of all, I think that you must have a guild somewhere near you. I think guilds are the hand weavers guilds across the country are the greatest resource imaginable. I, I was a yeah, I did the the St. Louis Hand Weavers Guild here is wonderful. The Chattahoochee Weavers Guild in, when I lived in Atlanta, they're wonderful. They're just they're they're so intelligent. They're so well knowledgeable. They have little individual study groups. Really, virtually anything that would interest you to follow, you'll have a potential mentor in your local Weavers Guild. That's that's my first um, suggestion. And otherwise, look look for things online. Look look at Instagram. Look for things online, and I think you, it's possible for someone who lives in a in a place that's distant from a guild to find someone online that they can have an e conversation with on occasion and and learn things from. But that hand to hand apprenticeship model is is my favorite. And if you just find a weavers guild and be a part of that. Yeah, if you think about making lemonade out of lemons, I think out of COVID, we've been able to find ways to connect through Zoom that we never, either we just didn't want to do that or we never thought about it. But um, so I hope she will, I hope you'll find what you're looking for out there. So too. Um, Kathleen Cook wants to know, do you have plans for workshops for printmaking? Um, I think to use spoon flour, to have the finished textile printed as spoon flour. Oh, so like in Canada or anywhere, have you thought about doing workshops for other people so they could do spoon flour? I, I haven't, I haven't. Um, you need a computer and actually, <laughs> right? I mean, all, all of a sudden Omicron has hit us and this is my first week of classes and I'm, I'm home online because we have like an 18% positive on campus and I have to get it down to eight. Um, and so I, I'll know soon <laughs> if I can teach this online. It, it's pretty clumsy at this point, but if I figure out how to teach it online, I could do it that way as well. Um, I'm, I'm pretty focused on staying here in my studio, mm, okay. and, and, but I'm, you know, if, if we come to a point where workshops are available, we might, we, we might eventually do workshops and I'll, I'll retire in three years. 
So in three years, I'll, yeah. yeah. Come back to Atlanta. You know, I'm going to, like, Dan and I say that when we die, we're going to be cremated and thrown in the lake. We want to stay here. <laughs> I think we want to come visit stay us. Here. We want you to come visit. <laughs> well, I, I could come visit. I, I have family still in Atlanta. Okay. And I, I could come visit. Uh, but it's, it's not hard to do. And here, I have this here because I did my class today. Digital textile design. This book has um, a wonderful way of doing basic patterns. And I, um, if you're interested in it, I will send you my handouts. Send me an email, lstrand at siue.edu. I will send you the handouts. And if you have Photoshop, you can give it a try. There you go. Well, several people were asking about the indigenous weaving women, and I have put that in the chat. Um, okay. So they are the, it's T-R-I-Q-U-E, correct? Yes. Okay. Those are the women. And, and I have been corrected. If those were backstrap looms? Backstrap. Okay. Sorry. They're, they're okay. just sticks and string and a strap that you wrap around your back. And to weave on it is really a, a thing for your, for the top of your thighs. You, you release the warp a little in order to open the shed. And then you step back again. So you have to keep moving yourself forward and backward to, um, to release and re-engage the tension. It's an incredible. It's, it's incredible. on my bucket list. Our guild has been kicking around the idea of trying to have, well, when we can again, have somebody come in and teach backstrap. We all want to learn how to do it. Um, Bhakti Zeke. Hi, Bhakti. Oh, Bhakti. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Laura. We're all saying hi because you, you haven't seen Bhakti's episode. Please go watch it. It I was know. pretty amazing. And she says, hi, Laura. Great that you've had a, you've got your hand to card loom now and can't wait to see what you do with it. Your generosity, your toward others is so beautiful. So oh, shout out there from Bhakti. Nothing that I have ever done meets what Bhakti does all the time, all day, every day. She's just an incredible, incredible artist and wonderful woman. Um, Kathleen Cook again wants to know: um, Will you, after you retire, you'll have time for either online or in-person classes? Do um, you think you'll teach more when you retire? I, I'll continue teaching. Okay. I, um, I, as I said, nothing, nothing beats a group of people to talk to and to learn from. So I, I will continue to teach. I think. Oh, here we go. I keep, sorry, the, my questions keep disappearing and they come back. Um, Toby Klein says first um, that, um, I think it's a she, was inspired by this chat. Uh, totally unrelated, she said, I've noticed that the small loom on the wall behind you, I have one that's similar. I don't know where it's from. Mm, that, and, that, and I know, and I can't find it in my head now. Um, oh my God. Send me an email. And I'll, <laughs> it'll, it'll come to me, right? When we're done today, it'll just pop into my head. Um, I, I've, I've been given several of them. And, um, and then they have tags on them. I really do know the name. I just can't think of it. What loom is she talking about? It's this little, this little, it's a, it's a folded up branch that's lashed together. It has a string at the top. It's been wound with a warp. And it's incredible because it's a very complex little twill, you know, diamond twill. It's been picked up and there's a weft that goes in. And then there's a stick that gets pushed to the back. Another pickup, weft goes in, stick gets pushed to the back. So they're making two sheds at once. And so they weave into the center of the diamond, right? Weave into the center. And then they use the sticks forward to weave out. Totally really? Fun. Yes. Is this a tricky thing too? No, no. Oh, okay. I've never heard of that. I, I'd never seen one before one was given to me, but. They, um, you Good know, eye, Toby. <laughs> yes. And the other one's a little fishing net that Lisa Arison gave me years ago. It, I, you know, objects, right? T textile objects, things that have been made. They're just inspirational. Just to see them all the time gives you a, a, a place to go in your head. That's always productive. Well, I cannot believe it, but we have to stop. 
Well, it's been very enjoyable for me to get it's to talk about this all day. It's really, <laughs> it seems, um, it seems crazy, but it's been wonderful to have it. Well, I, I have to do a disclaimer. Um, you taught at Callumwall? I did. Um, I was a student of yours years ago. Really? Yeah, I'm sure you remember me. I was the, you know, the incredibly talented and outstanding student that you had. <laughs> You can't know how bad my memory is for students. So one of millions that went through Calumwell. But I, I do remember you were, um, your energy and positive attitude about learning was wonderful. So it's so nice to be able to talk with you now, <laughs> a million years later. And now I teach, so it's, it's full circle. That makes me very happy. Okay. <laughs> very, very happy. Thank you so much, Laura. If you want to see Laura's uh, website, it is laurastrand.net. Um, then um, there's other ways to get a hold of you too, Laura. Um, uh, my email address is lstrand at siue, Southern Illinois University Edwardsville. Is it on? Is it on your website too? It is. Okay, so those of you who wanted to contact her about other things, you can do that there. Um, but there is information about Laura and her work on her website, so check that out. Um, I do wanna thank um, our sponsor for today. It is the Weavers Guild of St. Louis. They were so excited to have a local on to that they could sponsor today for textiles and tea. And they're doing that in honor of um, one of their own and that's Laura Blumenfeld. I think that's just a lovely way of honoring one of their guild mates. If you would like to sponsor textiles and tea or your guild or your event, we had other people um, asking about whether or not a, an event like your conference or something like that could sponsor textiles and tea, please contact us at weavespendie.org and there's all kinds of information or you can call me at the office and we can talk. Um, we're getting ready to work on our second year, so we're wide open. We've got spots available if anybody would like to sponsor an episode. Um, you can also, we are also supported by the generous donations from the Fiber Trust. Um, if you would like to see more programming like this, and I, as I started to mention earlier, there's some programming that's coming up later, which is the Guild Development Retreat. Um, that is geared toward guilds and helping them find ways to go that next step, whether it's to increase the number of members that they have or expand their programming. Um, it's a, a wonderful time to talk to other guild members and get some information about how to take your guild to that next level. And all of that is supported through the generous donations to the Fiber Trust and your membership. And you can do both of those at weavespindie.org. If you've missed an episode, please go back and you can watch it on Facebook. You don't have to have an account to watch Facebook. You can just go in and find any of the past episodes um, about uh, that we've had on Textiles and Tea. And we are also putting them on, face, on um, YouTube. So please subscribe. I have a reason for you to subscribe because if, if you if we get so many people to subscribe, we get money donated to HGA. And I think we need like 46 people. So come on, y'all. Go on to YouTube and subscribe. And when you do, it'll tell you, you'll get a notice saying a new episode has been uploaded. It takes a long time for those episodes to get uploaded. So they're a little bit slower than Facebook. Um, and thank you all so much for being here this week. We do appreciate it. Next week, we have Jenny Shu, who is a weaver and bead maker. Um, we're excited to have her join us next week. I hope you all have a wonderful week and happy tea.